When we think of space, we naturally think of the stars, solar systems, galaxies, the distant reaches of the universe. But space has another dimension to explore, not outward, but inward, into all the basic elements of everything there is on our planet. Here, a miniature world of space exists, a world filled with constant motion, one that went undetected for centuries. It is the world of the atom. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to the Free Radical Media Podcast. Uh, I'm ESP. We're here with uh, Patrick and Jay. And our guest today is Thad McCracken. Uh, you might have seen his byline on Disinfo. Um, he's a, a blogger, a prolific writer, uh, and I think he has some new projects coming up in the works, which we're going to talk about a little later. Um, I'll turn it over to Thad right now. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Uh, well, yeah, I am uh, an occultist. Uh, I started, uh, I became, a, I guess, a practicing occultist uh, about eight years ago now, so I've been into that for a while, and I've been writing for Disinfo. I have a book coming out next month uh, that I actually wrote a couple years ago and is finally coming out, which is kind of uh, the origin stories of how I got into the occult, which is a really odd story that I could get into uh, later if you want. Uh, and I've been writing a lot for Disinfo. I'm also a visual artist. I'm a musician. Uh, I've been playing in local Seattle bands for the last 10 years. I was uh, a vocalist in a band called The Nemesis Theory, and then I had another band called Black Science. I have a new music project called Chapel Supremacist, uh, which uh, is also a kind of like an occult film project, so I'm doing that now. Um, so just, you know, generalized into a lot of different stuff uh, and uh, doing hopefully doing more podcasts and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, uh, you guys asked me to be on the show. What did you, you guys want to talk uh, talk about some uh, uh, occult stuff? Or uh, <laughs> what did you guys have in mind here? Well, yeah, I think definitely uh, we wanted to talk about occultism a little bit. Yeah. Um, now, I, I, especially, you know, just from reading you, I mm -hmm. know that you're um, involved in uh, chaos magic, for example. Yeah, um, that's and, you know, and we've talked to some people who have come through um, the Wiccan tradition, you know, and obviously people out there are into ceremonial magic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your personal occult practice, and, and why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into it and, like, the zeitgeist of all that? Sure. Well, um, yeah, the, the story of how I got into uh, chaos magic is... Um, it's pretty strange. I actually like to joke that uh, I didn't choose the occult. Uh, the occult chose me because this is literally true. I mean, you read read stories about people that you know uh, have experiences where they think they're you know abducted by aliens or whatever. I started experimenting with astral projection when I was in my early teens. So that's kind of a precursor to the story. So when I started doing that, I had started having a lot of experiences where it was kind of like I'm in a dream state, and then these entities kind of would bind themselves to my soul structure and then kind of take control of my consciousness. Um, so I was at one point in my life where I was um, just like actually kind of like my lowest, lowest point in my life. I was kind of changing careers. I was unemployed and I was drinking a lot. And I'd been reading about occult stuff for a while at places like, weirdly enough, Disinfo, who I write for now. Uh, and, um, you know, I tried to read some, like, Aleister Crowley and whatnot, and I didn't, I didn't really like it, in fact. So I read about this stuff and kind of minorly experimented in it. And uh, then, so one, one day I was kind of uh, sleeping in the middle of the day, and there was, for lack of a better term, an entity of some sort in my room, and it kind of clapped its hands hypnotically. So I'm sleeping, it pulls me out of its sleep, and it kind of claps its hands twice, like, like wake up from a trance. And I sort of realized at that point something in me snapped. It's what a lot of um, 
uh, people of the more shamanic tradition would refer to as submission to a higher order of knowing. And so what happened is I realized that for about a decade of my life, uh, I had been experimenting with things like astral projection, but I was sort of in denial about the reality of these things because when you're raised in a westernized tradition, you're just, you're not, you don't, you know, you're, you're raised to think that inner experiences, you know, the idea of spirits, for lack of a better term, or I sometimes say something like fourth dimensional uh, time space perceptional entity, you're, you're raised to think that this stuff is crazy. And then I realized that I was in denial about this. And so when this thing unhypnotized me, it kind of made, it, it's something snapped and rather than I realized that rather than running away from that um, that I needed to actually use these abilities that I had to my advantage like this is something that if you can really focus you can use this to your advantage so it wasn't you know uh, this horrible thing that I was trying to run away from it was actually something to be embraced and so and also there was a message like uh, pretty straightforward that I needed to start doing occult stuff, basically occult sex magic, which is stuff that I'd read about and Grant Morrison talks about, but I never really had the balls to try. I'd read about it and I'd be like, well, you know, that seems a little weird and creepy to me. So that was like part of it is that you need to get involved with this stuff. So, you know, entity shows up my room, unhypnotizes me, and then, you know, I started pursuing this path of magic. And, and weirdly enough, I can say that my life instantly got a lot better <laughs> ever since I did that, you know, it was like there was something wrong with me, and it's funny, and you listen to, like, my old band, The Nemesis Theory, and you can even tell, it's like I'm writing lyrics about my struggle to accept this stuff, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it just kind of snapped, and I did, and that, that's that's how I got in the, into the occult, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> what what kind of paradigm would you have, were you subscribed to prior? Were you more of, like, an atheistic materialist or Christian or... Um, well, I actually, I was a Christian until I was about 16. Um, I went to church, I was an altar boy, and so the, the funny, I, I only bring that up because I've tried all of the traditional Christian rituals in my life, and found that none of them really did a whole lot as far as giving me a uh, truly spiritual, you know, kind of contact, or an experience that I really felt I was in tune or reaching with something larger than myself. And and when I was 16, I kind of abandoned that, and, uh, I, I, and I kind of had a lot of hostility for it for years, which I've, I've come to terms with. So I've, I've done the Christian rituals, but up at that point, I was definitely near a neo spiritual stuff. Like I said, I'd experimented with astral projection, and you know, it, it comes back to psychedelic drugs. Honestly, I have such a strong reaction to psychedelic drugs that that's what got me interested in this stuff in the first place. Like when I took you know mushrooms just one time when I was like an 18 year old kid, I went from you know being someone that didn't have much of an interest in spirituality to someone who was incredibly interested in spirituality and it's just because mm -hmm. I, I, I see things when I take hallucinogens that are just it's impossible to explain it's this mutating shape shifting art that's right. it's not really from you know like Freudian psychology would say that everything in your head is a reflection of the physical universe and this is alien for lack of a better term the stuff that I see in my head it's, it's coming from somewhere else it's not like a reconfiguration of ideas from this reality it's you know, uh, something coming from another reality. So when you when you see that as a kid, you know, or as a young kid, it really changed who I was as a person. So I started doing astral projection. But at that point in my life, to answer your question more specifically, yeah, I was I'd been reading books about remote viewing and alien abductions and and stuff like that for years. Essentially, I got a degree in psychology, and I realized but I couldn't really study this stuff in that context. Mm -hmm. So weirdly enough, after college, I kind of, uh, I got a job uh, taking care of developmentally disabled adults. And one of the perks of that job is that I could basically read on the clock all the time because a lot of it was, you know, kind of like babysitting. So, so I kind of like gave myself a second degree in reading all this weird stuff. But so, yeah, I was definitely weighted towards the stuff and yet there was still a part of me that supremely doubted some of the weird experiences and, and just didn't embrace it honestly was like ashamed of it or wanted to be more conformist and wanted to fit in you know and it was kind of when I had that hypnotic awakening incident that that kind of everything just kind of snapped in the <laughs> and, and put it into another perspective so yeah I mean it really I had a very spiritual look at the or bent or philosophical worldview but I wasn't into the occult at all I wasn't thinking about it you know in that in that right. kind of context you know right yeah and I you know I've, I've read a few articles here mm -hmm. I, I, I've 
read a few of your uh, Facebook updates, and you know you often <laughs> talk about your your hypnagogic type yeah, meditations. Yeah. And I was wondering because I'm not very familiar with astral projecting. Mm-hmm. Is that is that like the gateway to how you astral project? You sort of use like the barrier between sleep and dreaming and sort of go from there, or is it sort of is it different than that altogether? I it's a it's a fascinating uh, question because weirdly enough, what you're doing with astral projection, and for years you got to keep in mind that science, more kind of materialist scientist types have have tried to say that what's going on with alien contact phenomenon or you know abduction phenomenon, whatever you want to call it, is they've just been saying that sleep paralysis. And the strange thing about that is astral projection is essentially intentionally inducing a sleep paralysis type state, um, but. I, um, and then you're supposed to be able to roll out of your body when you induce this state. So it's not like you're just going to sleep paralysis. You're taking it further than that. And so, you know, these things like that and sort of alien contact are tied together. But ultimately, a lot of the Facebook posts I do, uh, it's – it, it, it's really a, a, a very on hash based uh, sex, me- or sex meditation. Um, Robert Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, I don't really know much about Crowley or the occult. Uh, I really don't, and and I don't like Crowley's writing at all. But Robert Anton Wilson, <laughs> yeah. I'd recommend to anybody has read Crowley. And he's so so he's kind of like a modern day Crowley scholar. And one of his takes in in, in the book Cause and Trigger about what Crowley was onto is he was carrying on this tradition of hash based sex tantra. And so really it's it's just, you know, it's a smoking pot and then having an orgasm and then – but it, it goes beyond that because it's also picking a, a, an intent and then thinking about that and visualizing particular things in states of stoned intoxication and then meditating in the after effect of that. And if you, I recommend it to anybody, although it gets pretty weird. So, yeah, a lot of those uh, uh, updates and status updates like that are, you know, that kind of uh, inducing, intentionally inducing that kind of state. And I will say I don't think it's just, you know, a lot of this in my mind is – kind of the evolution of consciousness or language towards telepathy. So, I mean, a lot of this is kind of, I mean, that's what a lot of this occult symbolism is. It's, it's, think, it's trying to use your mind's eye and think in the idea that you can kind of create reality, reality in your head, which is exactly what I've seen through astral ejection and a lot of various dream states and whatnot. So, so yeah. <laughs> so, so you would say there is a definitive difference between astral projection state and the dream state? Yeah, absolutely. Um, And there's just various, you know, we like to kind of file all dreams into one category of dreaming. And and, and there's various categories. I mean, I kind of have these hypnagogic uh, uh, communicate. And when I've been doing this meditation a lot lately, or gongitation as I jokingly call it, it's kind of odd because for me to remember it, what I've started realizing, I slip into these very quick kind of fever dreams. And then something happens that kind of shocks me awake. Like something, stri- the dream will get weird, and then I'll, I'll immediately wake up because of that. And when I do, I kind of realize that the only reason I remember what was going on is because I kind of pulled out of it and woke up. And that was the only reason I was able to write about it. And then a lot of times, though, these are sometimes like br- really kind of brief communique and and visions that you have but when you sit there and actually you write it down and analyze it you realize you know god that was an incredibly complicated thing that just happened there you know a a kind of communication um so yeah there's that and i would also say i've said for years when i started experimenting with astral projection i um i never really was able to like leave my body like robert monroe talks about who who is a uh, guy who wrote the books about astral projection who was I was using his techniques uh, and I never rolled out of my body in the way that he would talk about but what happened is that these entities would kind of come like I didn't have to go to them they kind of came to me so that's that's what happened and and I said it's really strange sometimes it's they kind of you know it's like it feels like there's something next to you and your dream state is alternating like in one state there's something else controlling your dream and you're kind of making the dream with it and sometimes it's completely in control and then sometimes you're when you're in that state your perspective then shifts and then it's like there's some entity that's next to you that's like actually binding to your soul structure, which is and and again not what I was expecting when I went into. Uh, so I, I always refer to those as astral contact encounters. And really enough, I don't have quite as many of those lately as as I used to years ago. Uh, but 
Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fascinating because, you know, it's like modern psychology just does not really give the dream state any 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 relevance whatsoever it's it's a shame yep. besides yep. the fact of you know something like what they i think they actually it's actually may, might actually be in dsm uh old hag syndrome yeah which, i was uh, gonna mm-hmm. bring that up as well yeah yeah right. and it's yep. it's it's wild how all these multiple people could have the same experience of being smothered by some old witch you know that just there's renaissance paintings of you know people being uh you know ridden by these these quote unquote witches you know or hags you know and people would experience you know they'd wake up and uh you know they would have that sleep paralysis and then sometimes they would actually have the experience of flying through the air right you know which is essentially like an astral projection type of experience and they rationalized it by saying that you know the witch down the street is you know, creating some sort of hex on them, you know, and they're really having a spiritual experience, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Oh, yeah, no, and, and like I said, it's, it, I think, you know, it, it, even science, it, you know, a lot of mainstream scientists kind of acknowledge that it cuts to the heart of what's going on with, say, the alien phenomenon, uh, and yet nobody really expands and says, oh, well, why don't we study that? It's just like, oh, that's sleep paralysis. Never mind that. <laughs> but yeah. not further answer asking the question, well, then what the, what the F is sleep paralysis? You know, it, well, there's something pretty weird there. And it's also fairly easy to induce. Like, I really think that most people, if you tried using Robert Monroe's techniques, like, it would probably work. You could probably do it. Uh, it might be terrifying. <laughs> I can say that. And I think that's, you know. Uh, I've had a few occasions where I almost, I think, woke up the name neighbors I, I scream so loud having sleep paralysis experiences yeah. you know having an entity standing in my doorway staring at me is is pretty frightening <laughs> yeah 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 and, and but but the more more to the point though you know i i do like i stopped doing robert monroe's sleep paralysis because it got too freaky uh and i had these kind of weird you know incubus succubus kind of like sex experiences which i could talk about more later if you want mm. uh but um so yeah i stopped doing it because it got so weird but i activated something in myself doing that that i then couldn't shut off like even though i wanted to be like okay i don't want any more of that uh i i you know it still kept happening from time to time and i i haven't listened to those tapes in years i haven't intentionally sat down and and, you know been like i'm gonna try and have an out-of-body experience um Precisely because it got too terrifying. But in retrospect, after all this has happened, you look back and you're just like, uh, you know, anything new can be scary. And I, you know, I, I don't really regret any of it. You know, it's it's like all seemed to be a learning experience. And even the times that I was terrified, you know, I can I think it's just terrifying because it's so strange, not necessarily because it was a negative influence in my life. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, uh, you hit the nail on the head, too, when you talk about mainstream psychology and its relationship to dreams. Uh, you know, I got a degree in, in just psychology, and I decided essentially that I, as I mentioned, I, I wasn't going to be able to... I literally had a college textbook which said no works of art of any value have ever been created under the influence of psychedelic drugs. Like, this is, <laughs> yeah, this is in a college textbook. And, and, you know, it's so funny. I'm such a smartass. Like, I had to raise my hand and be like, hey, I just read that. Can you defend your position? <laughs> like, yeah. instructor. And of course, she couldn't say anything, you know. And it's like, you know, I mean, I had, you know, like, 30 CDs in my bag at the time that were evidence that that's... <laughs> yeah. I have quite good. a number of Beatles albums that would... Yeah. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> you've ever heard of bands like the Beatles or you know Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd? You know, I I think that's been a pretty big influence on our culture, especially now with like tech culture, it gets even more complicated. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I dreams never came up in my entire. I have a BA in psychology, and I went to Ohio State, so you know, and this was ten years ago, so it's a school in the Midwest. But one, I realized to study alternate spiritual disciplines or philosophies i would have had to go to there was no schools in the state of ohio that did it so i would have had to leave the state uh and at that point you know i'm already hemorrhaging cash on a college degree and i'm like oh so go move somewhere live somewhere for another year to get in-state tuition like you know screw that and then the other thing is like most of those places like nobody even listens to these programs anyways it's like you can do whatever research you want and you know 
they're just going to ignore it and say it's pseudoscience and put it in, oh, you have your separate journal, which we don't read. You know, that's just yeah. kind of the way it works, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. and, yeah, how, how screwed up is that? So my entire dreams came up in Psych 101 in my Bachelor's of Arts in, you know, uh, psychology and never came up again. <laughs> like, and basically they entertained a couple different philosophies and then they put out the philosophy like, well, but we're going to, like, take the square peg and try and fit it in the round hole of a materialistic hypothesis that it's, oh, well, when we were hiding in caves, you know, when we were, our, our, when we were monkeys, you know, it was something to keep entertain us while we were sleeping to avoid predators, and it's this very materialistic theory that they've came up with about dreams that fits in, and you know, largely we all work upon that premise. Very few of us actually pay attention to our dreams, or you know, we're all kind of hypnotized into adopting this theory that they have of dreams, which is just from what I from what I've seen personally, like absolute nonsense. Like that theory about dreams that they're this materialistic, it's just survival, it's just your brain recounting, you know, uh, events. It's like that's just wrong. Like that's as wrong as thinking the Earth is flat, straight up. And yet there's such a prejudice against that idea that you know, um, yeah, it's a hard wall of materialism to cut through for a lot of people, myself included. I, you know, that's when I became an occultist, it, it was like something in me snapped, and I had to get rid of that part of me that questioned the legitimacy of the information that you can glean from altered states of consciousness, I guess. Uh, sure, anyways, yeah. sure. And, and, and it feels very much like um, <clears throat> the pre- prevailing ideology of the time is projecting itself onto the science, you yeah. know, rather than you know, science being empirical. I actually wanted to bring up, it It, mm-hmm. it brings up, um, I think it's the last article you wrote for Disinfo, most recent, um, Super Happy Comments Fun Time. <laughs> yes. Right? Which I, which I really enjoyed, and I would just, I just wanted to read, um, you, you say that, you know, people um, who are criticizing you in the comments, and I think this goes for people who criticize the occult in general, yeah, fall, yeah. fall into four basic categories, right? And I thought you yeah. really really nailed this um one scientific materialists who are infuriated by the idea that every problem in the universe can't be solved with more math right (laughs) uh two religious people who have been programmed from birth to think that the occult equals satan worship sure yep yep uh three conspiracy weirdos who often don't understand that their views about the illuminati new world order are actually fairly heavily influenced by religious people's slandering of the occult again spot on uh four people who think i do too many drugs (laughs) and and i i think those four categories really sum up people's um you know, distaste for the occult or distrust of the occult. I mean, that, those are the four categories I'd put them in, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, part of the reason I wrote that is because that comment section, those comments encapsulated all of those four camps. Like, quite, <laughs> It's like in this one comments thread, we've got every all four of those bases covered. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. uh, you know, and I must point out, as I did at the end of the article, that there was actually a lot of positive comments and, and some, you know, talking about how much they liked it and whatnot, cool. too. And that was a comment on a video that I posted about, you know, these guys doing, which I'd recommend to anybody to watch, called Dark Mirror of Magic. Magic, uh, which is uh, an occultist named Poke Runyon doing these classical uh, invocation exercises. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. And and the difference between chaos magic and, say, traditional magic is I've never done, I've never looked at the goetic table and said, I'm going to summon this demon or this entity for this purpose and gone through this really complicated, like they were saying, it takes them like six months to learn to get to the point where they can do this stuff. You know, it's, it's a, it's a pretty complicated art. That's the trouble with it, you know. I, yeah. I, I came into chaos magic through ceremonial mm-hmm. magic, and at yeah. a certain point, it's just like, you know, I really don't need all this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I can. Yeah. You know, well, but... I was I was very influenced by. I mean, at that point, as mentioned, I'd been reading a lot of books about. Well, obviously, shamanism. You know, stuff like Carlos Castaneda and McKenna, uh, McKenna mm-hmm. and whatnot. But and also, and you know obviously influenced by psychedelic drugs, but also remote viewing. And so weirdly enough, like, I saw what they were doing with remote viewing to a certain extent, and that's why some of, like, the digital protocol techniques of, like, I was like, but all they're doing is they're just attaching a, ra- they're attaching a meaning to a random number, and that's been shown to work. And then also I learned a lot of alien stuff, and alien stuff, you always have the, the whole telepathic communication, you know, it's these beings that are speaking to you with projected visions coming from these black eyes that they have and that shows up in like every 
alien account that you read. It's this whole level. So, yeah, I was already looking at it from maybe a more scientific perspective, like this is really about the evolution towards, you know, communicating telepathically and whatnot, uh, rather. So, yeah, I mean, just but the ceremonial magic of looking at it like you're summoning, it seems to work. And that the part of the other reason I posted that video is because people have emailed me telling me that they've done this stuff and it does, in fact, work. So, yeah. I, what, do you have any uh, experience with uh, actually doing that kind of thing that, or any, any weird stories? Or I mean, a little bit. And uh, I mean, I'll say I'll say that it functions if you do it properly and you're in the right uh, state of mind. You know, let, let's put it that way. It, mm -hmm. Like, it's all about intention, though. Is why yeah. I shifted toward chaos magic because you don't need all the trappings if the intention is there, right? Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, it really, I, I I feel that most of all that uh, all the window dressing in the ceremonies is really just to put you in a state. Yeah. where you're focused, you know, it's it's just basically meditative techniques. Well, I, I think really a lot of it comes down to meditative techniques. Oh, absolutely, yeah, no, I, and that's kind of, I think I even mentioned that in the article, it's really about, yeah, putting you in kind of this hypnotic, magical state of consciousness, uh, which weirdly enough, I made the new musical project that I'm working on, it's all mostly instrumental stuff, and that was honestly the design of that, was to aid in putting you in that state uh, with, with with kind of what we were doing. Um, but yeah, no, I, I absolutely, yeah, yeah, no, except, you know, I, hey, I hope, I hope someday I have time to actually try one of these uh, traditional, <laughs> like really put the work in, and you know, I I would love to just try it and just you know see what the hell happens because it is uh, it's very fascinating this stuff has existed for you know a long time now uh, uh, as a means of and that's a, another thing that I would challenge occultists when you look at say these goetic texts and these magical books does this look crazy to you I mean do the people like when you look at all these sacred geometrical patterns like does this stuff really look crazy because just when you look visually at some of the complexity of some of these things it's like it, you, it's hard to call it crazy, you know. It actually seems like a lot of intricate thought is going into this stuff. So it's yeah. extremely intellectual, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I, always, it, I always tell people if it's good enough for Isaac Newton, it's good enough for me. You know, <laughs> right. Isaac Newton was, you know, an alchemist and a occultist. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> on that Cosmos episode where they mentioned him, they so downplayed the influence of alchemy on him, and once again talked about alchemy in the context of. You know, it's trying to turn lead into gold, which was just a metaphor for the spiritual transformation of the soul, which still to this day, that myth about alchemy is still echoing through our society. Where I've read articles like by Smithsonian and, yeah, Cosmos, which is a television show about science. Still, they just pass it off like those crazy guys turning lead into gold, and it's like, that's not what it was about. <laughs> like, right. that, and that's, not, uh, that's part of that reaction of the scientific materialist philosophy to kind of downplay things like that, you know, and uh, mm. the, you know, that, that mainstream idea we have now, you know, because it, it seems like a lot of people who are real into the scientific community, and especially people in the atheist community, are very fundamentalist in their thinking. You know what I mean? Like when I when I yeah. listen to a hardcore atheist talk, for example, I feel like I'm talking to one of the the born agains, you know? Yeah. Like I it's the same vibe from these people. And yeah. um I I just I just feel like that's such a narrow way of thinking. Well, it's a narrow way of thinking and, you know, we've just like religion we've allowed this position to be acceptable and perpetuate where people that are completely ignorant to these topics are somehow authority figures on them you know it's like you can't just say there's nothing there but when you further get into these people have, have you looked at any of the sci research have you tried any of these techniques have you done dmt have you even read a, you know there's this huge attack against near-death experiences now in that set you know and how it's just hallucination and i'm like but have you actually even read the books about these things have you taught you know it's like you're seemingly just ignoring this and as i've said a hundred times in my mind i'm since the whole real I mean, it all comes down to binary thought, as far as I can tell. We're programmed to think that there's an extreme importance on dividing things into binary categories of real, 
versus not real. Real things that happen that other people can share and experience, and then not real are things that internally happen. And, and, and we're so bound to that binary thought pattern that it's really difficult to get through to us that inner experiences, uh, you know, are, are, are potentially, you know, are, are very real. And, and not only that, that these two inner worlds and the outer worlds are connected to one each other, and they're, and they're both related to one each other, one another. So it's really difficult to, to break through that binary program. And, and <laughs> the one thing I could say with my writing, you're absolutely right. There's, uh, you know, it's like, a, you know, there's a concept of clickbaiting and whatnot. And, and, you know, I've been condescended to by so many, you know, materialistic people in my life. I, I think the majority of people that I've hung out with and been friends with have been able Atheist. In fact, I played in a band for roughly four years with three other guys who are all essentially atheists, and it was, which is particularly weird because I'm writing lyrics about weird spiritual stuff, and none of the guys in the band even know what the lyrics in the band are about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this happened. So, yeah, I mean, I've been condescended to enough. I know how to. So, I mean, part of that is just, you know, I'm not, I, I'm, you know, kind of. Uh, prototypical like alpha male dude that grew up playing basketball in the Midwest and you know it's like I, I just don't like take shit from people so <laughs> I'm like I'm like you know what fuck you I'm gonna I'm gonna fight back uh, you know and I'm sick why have we let it let this position of materialism which is based sheerly around ignorance so there's zero understanding of alter states of consciousness or what's going on there and it's just it's and the idea is that we're gonna somehow understand this stuff by not studying it because that's what's all around it's like I know that that's not. There's nothing in there by knowing as little po as about it as possible, and we really need to move on. And also, we have to acknowledge that science, psychiatry in particular. I mean, the feel. I mean, and that's the other thing. Sometimes when I'm writing about hard science, I have to clarify. I am still coming at this point, you know, from the point of psychology. You know, that's that's what I studied in school. I'm thinking about this more in that term. That there's this field of psychology, and it's basically turned into creepy psychiatry, and mm -hmm. If you don't think that hallucinogens being illegal has something to do with that, you know, why does the government get to tell psychologists and psychiatrists, hey, you can't study these things? And if you don't think that's a barrier into the progress of scientific understanding, then I, I don't even know how you can argue that it is. Like, what is your argument about why we shouldn't study psychedelic drugs? It doesn't. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And and unfortunately, you know, it's it's starting to happen nowadays, which is definitely a good sign. It, it is, but I mean, you're you're right, and you talked mm. about that in this last article as well. You know, it, it's going back to um, you were talking about the near death experiences, yeah. right? Well, yeah. one of the main theories about that is that your uh, your brain releases uh, DMT, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, mm. then, if you really want to get to the bottom of this, why isn't it legal to study DMT in a in a yeah. clinical setting in in every university that would like to? You know yeah. what I mean? If you if you're really interested in finding out what's going on with that, why don't yeah. you you know start clinical studies? You know, and it seems like they just pick and choose. I mean, we'll make 400 antidepressants. You know, Pfizer will make a different antidepressant every year, but you know we haven't been able to study LSD in a clinical setting for years. Psilocybin, you know, all these all these you know potentially very interesting medicinal uh, chemicals. You know, they just pick and choose. You know, it, it seems yeah. like it's just a profit motive, you know, a political thing. And it's also interesting, too, if you go on, like, websites like the DMT Nexus or Blue Light, which is a which mm -hmm. is a website just dedicated to, to, you know, drug use, and you go through the, the users, you know, describing their experience, it's almost as if the people have sort of created their own underground science around these substances because the mainstream just won't touch it. And, you know, in some ways, I feel like it's a more authentic science in a way. You know, I mean, we're getting much more honest, um, honest anecdotal feedback, at least. You know. well, well, yeah, and, and the internet has become, you know, huge. As, I mean, it, the information technology, technology has progressed so quickly, and it's also fascinating that it seems like the roots and the design behind this information, information technology actually are is highly influenced by psychedelic drugs. There's always been, in the tech community, uh, you know, uh, 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 a subsection of people that have been influenced by from the beginning. Uh, but, yeah, and, and you're right, and hey, exactly what I said. I pretty much, well, there's a couple things. Part, I'm more of a 
an artist than I am a scientist. Um, but also, I mean, I wanted to study this stuff in school. I did, but I essentially realized that it was never going to happen. Like, the bias was too strong, so I had to kind of go do it on my own. And, and you're right. I think there is a certain degree of science, even though, again, I'm definitely more of an artist or, or a mystic than a scientist. But there's a certain degree of scientific method in saying, hey, this guy says astral projection works, and he designed this method of doing it, and that sounds insane, but what if I try it? You know, you are trying to rep replicate these experiences, like Robert Anton Wilson and Grant Morrison and uh, Alistair Crowley did this, you know, hash-based sex magic and replicated this experience of having contact with an alien or form of intelligence, and, you know, I did the same thing, and it, and it worked exactly the same for me as in, you know, different reflected through my own nervous system uh but you know it the, the claim isn't crazy you know so as much as i'm not a scientist there is something towards trying to repeat things and you know i i all i've really done is tried things that other people have suggested and found that those things worked so you know the more i can encourage other people to do this underground science because i got to be new I, I mean my opinion is psychedelic science is coming along but what it's being used for currently i mean alleviating the fear of death and cancer patients potentially you know uh fighting ocd stuff like that i mean this is primitive stuff right. uh <laughs> it, it should be replacing religion or transforming religion and our spiritual beliefs. That's the point to psychedelic science. Uh, the stuff, and, and you know, it's it's in its baby steps because let's face it, alleviating people's fear of death isn't that what religion's supposed to do? Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. Sure. It, sort of funny that we're showing that psychedelic drugs do this thing that religion is supposed to do but doesn't really do very well so you know, again, it, it is it's, it's slowly chipping away and because and, in my mind that's part of the and the other thing is people don't talk about the environment and how psychedelic cultures and history th thought of themselves as connected to the environment and had you know th there's like this the cliche of the crying indian you know uh, on tv and now that the environment's blowing up we have to actually really think well what was it about these cultures and these philosophies where they didn't feel compelled to destroy the environment and felt that they were in tune with it rather than separate from it. So as environmental uh, stuff starts continues to blow up in our face, which seems imminent now, um, I, I, I think we're, we're going to be forced more and more to turn to these these uh, these alternate methods. And you're right, it, it's going to have to happen on the underground level to a certain extent. It's I, I still think to this day you're not going to be able to do, you know, just like computers had to exist outside of the academic context, I think uh, the the the, my, uh, the mind sciences and the spiritual sciences are going to have to be underground, and it's got to be the underground pushing the overground. Right. I I, I agree. I agree. Uh, it seems like though <clears throat> we are experiencing. I mean, for example, like because of the internet, more people have access to information about the occult than ever yeah. in, in human history. And you know, besides antiquity, you know, yeah. deep antiquity, you know. Um, and it seems to me like like you were saying these cultures um i mean it just seems like cultures in the in the olden days you know uh who used these substances who used a true like meditative spiritual practice okay um mm. were just were healthier and now that like for example our religion is basically just another form of government now is institutionalized um you know the psychedelic mm. experience has been repressed Absolutely. It seems like that's kind of what has kind of shifted us away from a more organic lifestyle. Yeah. And I, I see now a revival of, you know, in the psychedelic community, in the occult community, where people are more and more starting to share these ideas, right? And I, I do see that as a positive. I mean, do you, would, would you say that you've seen, like, a growth... Well, I, I've seen it because, I mean, I, 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 my writing has been, you know, incredibly popular. What I, I mean, I was actually surprised by how much my writing has been, you know, popularized on Disinfo. And so I've seen it. I mean, I can't even actually – I always encourage people to friend me on Facebook because I do uh, posts about dreams. And actually, weirdly enough, I could tell you one in a minute that, that I just had the other night that goes right along with what we're talking about, actually. Uh, so – 
so I encourage people to friend me there. So yeah, I mean, I've gotten to the point where I mean, I I, I still don't really make much money doing this or anything. So I I work a day job and I'm married and I'm working on a billion different projects. But I can't even keep up with like my Facebook account. Like people are constantly emailing me and asking me spiritual questions, and I'm seeing a lot. I mean, there's a lot of interest out there, but simultaneously, so it is growing. And I I definitely think this generation. Well, it's well known that people are increasingly frustrated with with religion, and I think people are equally as frustrated with the whole, you know, just atheism, materialist standpoint. So I think it's it's creating a, a, a an interest, but simultaneously, I mean, I've often said that for every new forward-thinking occultist, there's probably two, you know, new creepy conservative Christians, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's just true. They're, like, the Mars Hill Church, which is a super conservative, and, you know, I live in Seattle, and Seattle is you know, politically one of the more liberal places. We have gay marriage and weed, and we just passed the $15 minimum wage. Uh, we simultaneously have the most corrupt tax code in the country, literally. Poor people pay more in taxes and rich people pay, pay less here than anywhere else. So it's this bizarre, you know, we're trying to be progressive. Ultimately, we're still enslaved to the profit margin. Sure. Uh and, uh, and 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 but even even here, uh, you know, there's like there's a Mars Hill Church, which is a, which is a conservative church, uh, which is trying to you know market you know Christian rock music and it's hit, but it's still super misogynist and it believes, <laughs> and it believes that you know uh, abortion is wrong and uh, gay you know homosexuality is gay. you know these are things that are going to get you to go to hell. And this guy has a campus university downtown because he's this successful and pulling in this much cash. So. Yes, there's a growth of this stuff, but I see things like that, and it's just like, you know, I'm not – that seems to be growing even faster. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think it'll be – I think it's going to take a long time, but I think – Again, I've had to say, well, this is what I've seen in Visions, that if the environment really starts going to shit, we're not going to have an option but to, to look into this stuff anymore because it's going to become – start to become – very obvious that our way of doing things and consumerism is just it was a dead end and you know it's it's not, it's going to be more and more difficult to argue that that position so but you know as I said hopefully I, I think it's going to take some time <laughs> that's what I think like a very long amount of time yeah I mean yeah, it's <clears throat> it's true I mean you're you're probably right there I mean I don't see it changing overnight you know um, <laughs> well, well then what do you think <clears throat> what do you think people like us could do then Right to try to to try to help this process, you know. Uh, this is a question I ask everybody. Gotcha. Right, but um, what what do you what do you think we can do just as individuals and as communities to try to uh, to try to kind of salvage some of this? I mean, um, well, I I think that uh, just get, I mean we have to be more vigilant, you know. I'm I'm trying, and and I can say. On a positive note, uh, you know, the attitudes in the popular media towards uh, materialism in particular have become increasingly skeptical. You know, I think a lot of, like, what Richard Dawkins and that set did to mobilize, uh, they were such pricks, and they were so harsh about the way that they were going about it that it, it really has, like, it's, it's, it's been a good voice for, it's weirdly helped the psi phenomenon people who have been repressed for so long like people are fed up with the whole hardcore atheism and all, not only that it's become so extreme that you know uh, that it, it's 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 hard to you know people people aren't responding to that uh, so I, as far as what can people can do I, I, you gotta free yourself first pursue some kind of spiritual practice I would recommend it like don't just talk about doing magic literally go out there and do it you know next time you take psychedelic drugs rather than say taking them and going to a concert or hanging out with your friends or something you know design a ritual make a purpose to it like try and you know i am trying to learn something or progress this into my life and i think the more that we can tune in to the inner force that's the variable there that they you know they're not no no amount of resistance to that is going to be able to fight uh, people that really, and you know, I look at that, you know, it's almost like, I look at what I'm doing as, as honestly, in a way, like developing technology. It's just like, if you really develop your psi abilities 
I think you can kind of stay one step ahead uh, uh, of the curve. And, you know, if the other side in the competition that's trying to mold society isn't doing that, I think absolutely it could give you a distinct advantage. And not only that, the, if the other side totally does not believe that what you're doing has any legitimacy, then they're going to have absolutely no idea how to fight against it. And maybe in their attempt to understand what you're doing to fight against it, they would get in too deep themselves, and then everyone benefits, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's sort of, I sort of feel like that's the common denominator. Like, you know, on one hand, you have the occultists, and then on the other hand, you have the institutions, you know? Yeah. And I feel like the, the occultists really are just, they're individuals. It's people trying to have an individual direct experience without relying on an institution to give it to them. That's essentially what it is. And I feel like that's why, you know, science, religion, you name it, that they're, they're trying to suppress that because it's threatening to them. They don't want you to have the freedom to be able to have a, a, an experience of the divine on your yep. own, you know. I, I agree completely because that it throws consumerism in and some people ask me you know why what's the point to what you're doing and I'm like well the point is that we're just we're you know we're leading ourselves to crisis and consumerism makes us miserable and you're absolutely right the idea that you can get bigger kicks dirt cheap by manipulating your own consciousness is obviously threatening to a society that is dependent on moving products and increasing profit margins and increasing building. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. That's why this stuff is so controversial when you get down to it. And I think even with the legalization of marijuana, that, that aspect of it isn't being addressed, is that part of the reason this stuff was, even just weed, was suppressed for so long is it does make you start questioning things to a certain extent. You know, you're like, why? You know, Yeah, I mean, even Bill Hicks had a classic routine about you know I I, I I could do anything just as well when I'm high I just realized you know there's no fucking point I might as well stay home and play the banjo or not the banjo the, the not, sitar, or, yeah. sitar yes yeah. <laughs> so, so you know I, I think even with the legalization of pot people aren't actually ta addressing that aspect that pot is something that makes these workers lives better and makes them think you know fuck owning a second car you know if I have an extra day off a week that I could spend with my kids and, and, and get high and go to a concert or whatever you know maybe that's a better life than and, you know, and putting all my money into Wall Street and the war machine. Uh, but so, and on the positive end too, what people do is support pot rise. I definitely think that pot has the ability, and, and and it's so funny now that conservatives support weed rights too. Like both sides yeah. now, but it's the only thing our government can agree on at this point is weed. Like we want <laughs> legal weed. <laughs> That, in my mind, has an enormous potential. Like, weed is a lot more of a hallucinogen than I think people realize. It has a lot yeah, more potential right. potential to manipulate consciousness than people realize. So, again, if we start with that, then maybe we can get it to mushrooms next. And then if mushrooms become legal, then... Game over. Well, my mind, it's, 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 it's still a lot of hard work, but nobody conceptualizes this. And this is something I... I did a kind of an acid trip years ago, and I had this vision that was like stressing, like what's going on with the weather and what's tied together. If this is to, you really need. If you want to avert this, you have to legalize psychedelic drugs. And it, you wouldn't think that the and, and you're you know it's something that comes to your vision and, and you know that's trippy or whatever. But then the more you think about it, if religion was forced to compete in a capitalist system against a psychedelic based religion, it wouldn't be able to. If you have a church service where you can legally give people hallucinogens and provide them with a direct spiritual experience, it's going to be the Coke Pepsi challenge, you know? Are you, is the, are you, especially among the youth. Like, you know, if the youth are allowed to choose between a psychedelic-based religion or a normal race religion, I think you could probably do some research to show that, like, eight to one, they choose the psychedelic religion. So uh, it's definitely, you know, we got to keep fighting. But, I mean, that, again, like, when would... Weed is just becoming legal. My best optimistic guesses would be in another 20 years, maybe that could shift towards psychedelic mushrooms, but... But. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. You know, it's funny. A lot of people forget. Well, actually, a lot of people don't even know you have cannabinoid receptors in your brain that are only susceptible to THC, which is yeah. found in marijuana. And what you know, one of the funny things that uh, that I always look at uh, the very first Pope Benedict of of the of the Catholic faith. He had a he had a quote that went something to the effect that. Religion is nothing more than the physical representation of spirituality. It's not meant to offer enlightenment. It's merely meant to offer the physical representation thereof. And I feel like that just hits the nail on the head of what all organized religions are. 
And what's amazing to me is when you look at the history of religions, you know, you have the Eleusinian mystery cult, you have the Soma cults in India, you have the Gond smokers, you have the ayahuasca the ayahuasca with the shamans down in South America, you have the peyote with the Native Americans, you even have Rastafarianism with the with marijuana. And, and you know, and today we now have the Native American church using uh, uh, peyote, you have the Santa Daime and the Uneo de Vegetal using ayahuasca. So you, <coughs> you, you have all these different groups of people who have used psychedelic substances throughout history. And what I always do is I, I just take the facts because when you're arguing with someone who's just using their book I, mean, I always use the Christians as an example who just argue Bible verses when you keep repeatedly showing them facts and they just keep coming at you with the Bible eventually they realize that you have more information than they do and even when you want to look at the Christians I mean you can look at the uh, the Good Friday experiment where they gave people mushrooms and the yeah. uh, at the Harvard uh, uh, Church uh, you can you can read like natural experiences Teresa of Avila you know, you have all these people who who experience such incredible, you know, pure spiritual experiences, and I have a really hard time believing that the vast majority of people who go to church on Sunday, who you know stand up, sit down as they're told, read a couple songs, and and, and shake everybody's hand and eat a wafer, are having a, a purely divine spiritual experience. And like you said, you know, you, you take even even if you just smoke a little bit of ganja and you sit yep. there and you meditate. I mean, the experience is going to just be incredible, and it's going to lead you to realize that, oh, hey, you know, I'm I can get a lot more out of sitting here by myself in a meditative, quiet position than you know going to a church or like you were saying as well earlier. You know, when you <coughs> when you do one of these one of these substances, when you smoke some weed or you, or you take a psychedelic and you're hanging out with your friends, you're at a you're at a concert or whatever, you don't get what those substances are really truly able to give you being yeah. in that environment and i think that i think really to me it's educating people on the facts of these substances because there's too many people out there who advocate these substances but advocate them in a way that is misconstrued or is misunderstood as hey let's just do these things get fucked up because yeah. there's there's way too much that these things can do to benefit society, to move us forward intellectually, spiritually, and if there aren't people like that out there advocating that and proving these things, then it's going to be where, you know, in, in a lot of the cases with your articles, just ignorant rhetoric spitting out just recycled things that have been said for the last 30, 40, 50 years, and... You know the people who are who are speaking those things. They're not even having. They don't even have their own free thought on the subject. They're just listening to what other people said that were negative about the subject, never actually experiencing it themselves, and they're just spewing that out. Well, if you educate them, then maybe there would be a chance that maybe they could, you know, realize that they're wrong and that what they've been told is wrong. Because isn't that the isn't that well, really what a psychedelic substance does? Is show you how wrong you are. It. It. I think. Uh, yeah, as much as showing you how wrong you are, and this is why I think psychedelics are very important, although I must say, you know, like I said, weed, I only do psychedelics these days, I mean, uh, you know, like once a year, twice a year maybe, and try and do them ri ri uh, ritualistically <laughs> rather than... Um, and, you know, and that's not enough people, as you were mentioning earlier, talk about that, you know, yeah, there's so this kind of just party, party vibe. And it, it's like we, we have to put shamanism back on the table and say yeah. these, you know, and respect the history of the spiritualism. I think the set and setting that most Westerners, myself included, take psychedelics in are ultimately that it's a party or party type setting. And then on top of that, that it's just drugs screwing with your head. So essentially that's that's a formula to intentionally try and edit out most of what's going on to, you know, maintain or be able to exist socially. Uh, yeah, and, 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 but exactly with psychedelics, what they, the reason that I'm such an advocate, even though astral projection was involved total sobriety, I was talking about that earlier, one of the weirdest things I've ever done, is because it takes you out of, of course, a lot of my occultism, if you read my articles, there's a lot of looking at the world as art and looking at... I mean, I could describe magic as look, 
trying to view the universe as comprised of consciousness rather than matter and acting accordingly. I mean, that's really, to a large extent, that's what you're doing. You're saying, I'm going to look at what's going on at, from a standpoint of consciousness and operate from those parameters rather than the scientific parameters of looking at it, uh, you know, from purely materialist. And I think, ultimately, like the yin and yang, the chaos order, you're, 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 there's this spiritual balance that you're trying to achieve between both, which is why Westernized magic, I think, differs from traditional shamanism, which was going way in with hallucinogens. Uh, but what hallucinogens provide is to take you out of your character. When you start looking at the world from a standpoint of consciousness, rather than seeing one world, you're seeing billions of intertwined plots. You know, when I, there's people that live across the street from me, they wake up every morning, they have stories, they, you know, they talk to each other, they go to these jobs. Uh, so I can't even, from that standpoint, when you look at, from that standpoint, you can't even keep up with what's going on in your block, let alone your city, let alone the world. Your brain doesn't even have the process. You are one little plot focused in, and you have all this conditioning, all this upbringing, and what psychedelic drugs uh, uh, have the potential to do is take you out of that very quickly. And then now you're looking back on your conditioning, your program. You're looking at your character and thinking, oh, before I was this character, maybe I was something else. Or maybe there's some, maybe I'm going to go back to whatever that is after I leave. And it is this detachment, which I think has been reflected through culture in a way in like the kind of postmodernist irony. And we, we don't address the spiritual roots of that. But I think a part of it is really looking at yourself. And, you know, Robert Anton Wilson, who I quote a lot, was called that intelligence squared now now your character is thinking about your character and when more and more people are doing that then intelligence progresses because now you're not just going on the character that you begin and you're questioning that character and i think with a good occult practice saying how can i make that character better you know I, I don't like that character, you know, and, and, and this would be maybe the psychological potential is when you get outside of your character, you can then say, we can do better than that. I don't, I'm not happy with who that character is. I want to change who that character is. So, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, no, you know, it's the shattering of the ego and then rebuilding the ego in a, in a much more positive way to, to help society, help the environment, help the world, help the universe. You know, I one one thing I always say, you know, there's there's what there's 7.7 7 billion people in the world. So there's 7.7 7 billion roads to enlightenment. You know, you, you, each person has their own path that they're on, and and that's why that's one of my hangups with organized religion is that it there isn't this nice neat prepackaged thing that leads everyone to where you're. I mean, we're all going to the same place, but we're all taking different roads to get there and you know there's no there's no freeway where we can all get on a bus and just yeah. and just go there you know it, it takes a lot of work that's what i think a lot of people in in a lot of the organized religions it, it to me it seems like an easy way out you know what i mean you, yeah you, oh absolutely absolutely yeah you, you have, uh, no go ahead oh yeah no i it, you either i mean Part of why the occult is controversial, and, and honestly, people ask me you know, all the time, you know, I, I'm thinking about trying this stuff, and weirdly enough, one of the first things that I say is, like, how well do you handle criticism? Because I can say, weirdly enough, a lot of this, from my perspective, has been my higher self, or what they would refer to as holy, gu holy guardian angel, uh, just, you know, dissecting me and being like, dude, you know you need to pull your shit together essentially like right. and, you know it, it's and it's a lot of work that's the point it's hard work it, it's it's weird i grew up playing sports and i'm still a sports fan which you could think what people would think that weird as a psychedelic musician but there's something there's something in you know watching these athletes and whatnot that it's not just about talent it's like you actually have to bust your ass and you know you have to put in more work than everyone else too and spirituality is the same thing like an occult path like this stuff is hard you know it, it's very difficult even on my Facebook blog, I don't think I even let people on, like, sometimes, you know, there's things going on behind the scenes that I'm like, damn, I fucked up, and, like, I was basically shown how I fucked up, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and, and how to get better, it's a continual process, and you're right, people want easy, easy answers, that's why they love organized religion, they want to be told that you just, you know, say that you accept Christ in your heart before you die, and that's all you have to do, uh, or they want to be told materialism is almost even more simplistic, because it's saying, there isn't spirituality, there's nothing there, like, that switch can go off like it doesn't exist turn it off so in a way you know yeah you got both sides and both materialism and organized religion appeal to 
easy answers, people's desire to have things very simple, and the occult's a hard sell for that reason, because consumerism is based on selling people easy answers, and unfortunately, with the occult, like, anybody that would ask me for spiritual advice, I'd tell them the same thing, like, this is really hard, you have to work on it, you know, you have to have a certain grit, you know, it's not something that anybody is, it's not going to happen for you, you got to make it happen, and, and you know, you got to be open to the idea that part of what's wrong with you is that there's something about you that you don't like, and you need to change it, you know, so... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, it, it reminds me of a quote, um, you know, the philosopher uh, Zizek. Um, mm-hmm. I just watched one of his documentaries recently, but he said, you know, freedom's painful. Most people have to be forced into freedom, right? It, you know, and in a cult practice, you know, it's it can be hard. You mm-hmm. know, like emotionally, spiritually, it can be difficult. You know, and and people um, people do just you know they want to go to church like they go to McDonald's. You know, it's you know, institutionalized. Like, everything in our culture is so institutionalized like that. You know, it's... You, you go to church and you consume the sermon. You know, yeah. it's that nature of consumption. Whereas with, like, an occult practice, you're engaging with spirituality not only on your own terms, but in a way that I think is more fully realized than sitting and, and listening to Mass or, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, any kind of, like, organized prayer that you go to on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, abs- I mean, absolutely. It, 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 it requires discipline, it requires introspection, and I'd say particularly as a culture, we are completely averse to introspection, mm-hmm. because part part of how you get people to keep buying things is to keep people, uh, you know, addicted to this idea that that's what's going to bring them happiness rather than, you know, and the more you turn them towards introspection, as mentioned, it's like they realize that you can do, you know, things like dreaming are free and meditating are cheap and, you know, exercise is really cheap. You know, it's like all these things. So you're right. Consumerism is so based on keeping people this answer. And, you know, the idea that you're going to buy happiness through a product is a pretty easy answer. I mean, it doesn't get easier than that. And, and that's that's what consumerism preys upon. And, and we need to start addressing it. Absolutely. I yeah. will say this, though. You know, when... Yeah. Uh, even in the occult side, you know, a lot yep. of the organized occults, like uh, when Crowley talked about uh, the Golden Dawn, he said, you know, I uh, I joined them, they, they swore me to secrecy, and all they did was teach me an alphabet. You know, there there is a certain <laughs> level of indoctrination and in, in sort of uh, going through the motions in a lot of established occult practices, and I think that's why chaos magic has really become such a it's, it's so embraced by the younger generation who are starting to pick up these practices because they're saying, you know, I want to do this on my own. I have all this information at my fingertips. If I have a question, you know, you mm-hmm. as as I'm sure you know, these people just show up. You know, it's like you 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 kind of hit a roadblock, and then all of a sudden there's somebody there explaining you the roadblock that you're at. And it's it's a very it's an it's one of those things where chaos magic gives you the opportunity to truly as a person experience your reality as much as you can and as fully as you can while at the same time realizing that you're still just one small piece of the entire reality yeah well I mean it's weird it's because I actually had all these lucid dream experiences where it was kind of showing me the idea that you individually it's about focusing on your own inner microverse and that and, and realizing that you're independent and no better than all the other ones and yet simultaneously that you're all tied together which is where it gets trippy uh, but um, yeah no I mean it, a, 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 a fundamental tenet of occultism like hermeticism in particular is as above so below and that mm-hmm. you're trying to attain internal God well, as above, so, low, so below is more that the world can be looked at metaphorically, and that everything that happens here is a metaphor for something larger that happens in the in the macrocosmos or the macroverse. Uh, and um, so, so that that is again completely different from the scientific rationalist, which, look, which looks at the world objectively and literally, and you know, uh, and, and it's so you know that nothing is a metaphor or that everything is. But you're right, hermeticism. It's about the idea that you anyone can attain godhood, that you can become god, and that's completely different philosophy than the materialist perspective, which leads us to think that the best that you can accomplish as a human being is to own. Uh, 
four houses and, you know, have orgies with prostitutes, uh, you know, which yeah. is what people currently aspire to. And until we can get to the root of that problem and say, you know, there is actually more that you can do as a human being than be a rich person who has, you know, I find it so funny because I watch like half these stories about creepy, like if, I don't know if you saw the show, watch the show at American Greed, but like so often it's like these guys, it really has to do with, you know, sleeping with creepy women that are younger than, or, or, or prostitutes or having cocaine orgies. Like there's this fundamental sexual impulse that they're not acknowledging and that's why they wanted to become a billionaire so they can do this. And it's just like, you know, I mean, really, that's your version of parent, that's the best you can come up with, uh, you know, and it's like, I, I can tell you a bunch of stories, you know, that's just like things that have happened to me that are so weird that that then looks incredibly stupid. And so getting this idea that, you know, people that are pursuing this this culture of wealth is it's really, you know, these people are dilettantes and Philistines. You're, you know, you're uncultured if that's what you want in life, which which again is is right in the Bible with Satan tempting Jesus, you know, you could have all of this if you wanted it. And the answer to that question is no. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it seems like so many people for, forget that little, you know, it's convenient that so many people forget little bits of their holy text, you know. <laughs> I, one yeah. of the things, you know, like I said, I kind of rejected Christianity, and then I kind of had an, uh, an experience later on, which, you know, made me think about it more and more, and I think a lot of it is just, you know, it's it's diluted shamanism. It's based, you know, based on shamanic ideas and books that were, you know, pre-existing, so I, I, I definitely think there's some wisdom to it, and I do find it fascinating that Jesus is decidedly anti-wealth, and how that's rectified with <laughs> yeah yeah right <laughs> he wasn't anti-gay he wasn't anti-abortion I, I, he doesn't say a damn thing about any of that in the bible but he he, he speaks pretty sternly about the accumulation of wealth and how that's spiritually damning in several different places <laughs> yeah and, yeah so so how how that's become the icon for these mega churches uh, you know it's it's like i said like a lot of these people's opinions it doesn't even make any sense like even it, it doesn't even fall in line with their own spiritual texts let alone <laughs> Right. You know, yeah. Anything. At the end of the day, in the West, it seems like overall our religion is capitalism. You know. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, and, and it's important to note. Well, sometimes when the anti psi crowd, if anyone wants to, you know, kind of argue with that, you have to point out that the U.S. military studied remote viewing and came to the conclusion that there was something there, but they couldn't weaponize it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Princeton, the pair research lag style, you know, studied uh, kind of like psychokinesis and the uh, mind's ability to manipulate things like random number generators and whatnot. And their conclusion, again, there's something there. We just can't figure out a way to make money off of it. Right. And then thirdly, you have Sony and the Sony Corporation also studied psi phenomenon. Same conclusion. There's something there, but we don't know how to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. So when some, you know, these skeptical people that honestly listen to James Randi, who was a skate stage musician, uh, you know, in his opinion or something, and it's yeah. just like this guy isn't even a scientist. And actually, three different organization scientific organizations have studied this stuff now and their conclusion is that there's something there all three of them's conclusion though is essentially it doesn't fit in with capitalism and so the skeptics look at the failures of these as evidence that it's not there and really what these things demonstrate is we don't it doesn't what's there doesn't fit into the way that we do things that's yeah, the conclusion it doesn't and fit into the paradigm right? exactly Exactly. I know I know we're coming up on our time here, so sure. I want to I want to spend a little bit of time. Um, you know, I want to talk about your book. I want to talk about your film. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so yeah, tell us uh, tell us a little bit about the book first of all. Uh, so the book is called The Galactic Dialogue. Uh, weirdly enough, I actually wrote this book before I ever started writing for Disinfo. It kind of, um, I don't know a whole lot about putting out books. It's the second book that I've written. First book, I just, I never even promoted that much because uh, I just didn't think it was that good. This one, I like. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's I told you the, the story of the being, uh, showing up in my room and summoning me into the occult. It's really my origin stories of how I got into the occult. And it's kind of the lead up. Uh, to uh, this experience where I had where I, I kind of made contact with my holy guardian angel it showed up and kind of explained to me the nature of the holy spirit uh, as it, like this esoteric concept you know and, and also explained to me that it was the gray aliens and that it existed outside of time and showed me a model of viewing the universe which is again completely different than the materialist model of looking at the universe uh, you know and this is a so it's a book about that and it kind of goes up to how I went from being in a cult 
about this to making contact, having this experience where I made contact with my Holy Guardian Angel. Uh, it should be out uh, in the end of June, early July. I'll definitely look. Uh, if you look at this info, you'll see posts about it for sure. Um, I'm actually designing the cover art right now. So, yeah, it's a, it's a long time coming out. And uh, let's see. Other projects. I'm in another musical group. Uh, as I mentioned, I was a musician. Uh, for you know, I've been playing music around Seattle. I've been in two different bands for the last you know decade, and the, my last band broke up. And I'm working on with a friend of mine on this occult film project, which kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, maybe you guys could link it on the website there uh, uh, to disinfo. And yeah, I recommend watching it. Yeah. It's a uh, it's working, uh, you'll have to read the write-up on it, which I can go into briefly, because again, a lot of this occult process, you know, um, really enough, I'm not the biggest William S. Burroughs fan in the universe, I, not of his writing, but the process that he stumbled on with, or the way that he wrote, wrote about it, and I, I think maybe I kind of explained it a little better with uh, Brian Geisen, was this process of, you know, the cut-up, and so... My friend and Dean and I are both occultists, uh, so you know it's weird to you know know another music. And it's, it's, again, these totally random things. Like I started recording albums. He, Dean, is actually an engineer who recorded the last two Black Science records that I was involved with. And of course, I come in the studio, and he's got like. Uh, Grant Morrison books lying around, and I, I didn't even know this about him. Like I'd known him for years, I didn't even know that he was a cultist. So this is a so and so now after his project ended up going on indefinite hiatus and Black Science, basically I'm kind of I want to find other musicians to do it, but basically people moved and had kids a couple years ago. So we're working on this, and so we didn't realize when we first started working on it. Weirdly enough, we went to this symposium uh, a block away from Dean's house about occult films. And then we kind of made the that Brian Butler, who was used to be a former disinfo contributor, uh, made, and he now works with Kenneth Anger. And we thought they were good, and it's an interesting concept. The idea, you know, the whole point to like an occult film is largely, or you know, to a certain extent, it's like a music video. But the whole point is to induce an altered headspace. Headspace. So you know, there's not like dialogue or anything. The whole point is to definitely tell a story and really just put you in, in an altered headspace obviously better uh enhanced by marijuana or uh lsd so we started making we started working on this project and we made the soundtracks and then after we did that we kind of realized like this is really almost like a cult soundtrack music and so we started working on that as it turns out um doing video editing uh, is a lot like doing sound editing through pro tools so we ended up I, I, you know, I. If you would have told me a year ago that I was going to be making occult films and that they, 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 they were good, I would have been like, I, I'm not that, you know. There's no way. And then, you know, like a year, and, year and a half after we went to the symposium, thinking like, you know, I think I could probably make better occult movies than we saw Brian Butler and some of these other people do. And like, uh, it's there. It's called Visitors, Super Visitors. Uh, if you have 23 minutes, definitely uh, check it out. Uh, it's definitely trippy. So again, I, back to the Burroughs Geisen. It's taking a bunch of YouTube you know videos with my own sigil art and kind of combining them together and what i found when i did that is that we intentionally the video has this narrative that we didn't intend at all uh when when we were watching it, and it took me like watching the third or fourth edit of it to be like wow this is really strange like not only did a lot of the things with the music line up like we just throw video in and we're like that lines up exactly with the music somehow so yeah definitely it was it was the whole project was designed to induce this magic state of consciousness and in in working on that ourselves, we did, and something seemed to like kind of take control of the scene and lead us to making these occult movies that are are strangely weird and have narratives that weren't even even intended. So it, it's definitely going along with that. I, I definitely think there's something to the cut up process, uh, uh, which is, in a way roughly in tune with just putting yourself in a magical it's you know almost uh, inducing possessive states where something else is taking you know a hidden hand is coming and taking control of the scene so uh, if any of that sounds interesting like I said I think I sent you guys the link if you could post that with the podcast I'd yeah definitely sure. yeah, I recommend definitely it will. It's gotten a really good reaction so far, and, and we have another one that's coming out this summer, so my book should be out in June, so yeah, it's a pretty big year, we're going to have like two occult films, an album, the album soundtrack to that, Chapel and Promises, and if you want to check out any of my music, it is at dmiocults at bandcamp.com if I want to keep doing promo stuff, if you want to friend me on Facebook, it's uh, facebook.com uh, backslash thaddeus.mccracken, uh, yeah, and feel free to friend me, I write about music stuff over there, um, as long as you're curious about that kind of thing, it's cool, and I'm uh, at that mccracken on Twitter. Twitter, and you'll get updates about all the stuff. So yeah, book coming out next month, new occult film that's really good in July, and you know hopefully doing more podcasts and stuff like this. Yeah, cool, awesome. cool. And we'll definitely have all those links in the video. Um, maybe put them up on the website and stuff too for you.